Hey, I'm Friendly Baron, and the stunt jump speedrun finishes with arguably the hardest jump of them all, going off the cliff onto the lighthouse island. It's a satisfying climax after doing the previous 49 jumps in just over 22 minutes, but this single jump does not define the category. In fact, there is a ton of technical details going into many of the other jumps, much more than just a simple monkey brain C jump, hit jump, land flat basis. Let's take a look at how all 50 jumps are chained together in such a short amount of time, and how routing between the stunt locations plays such an important role. Unfortunately, before getting to the driving, the start of the stunt jump speedrun uses an autosave file that is made at the end of GTA 5's prologue, leading to the beginning of the Franklin Lamar mission. Normally the player would pick one of the two cars and follow a heavily scripted drive through part of the city. Even though in the full game speedrun that drive has been optimized like crazy, a strat known as mission skipping is allowed in these side categories, where by failing a mission three times, you can skip to the next checkpoint. Kicking this car four times does just the right amount of damage to trigger a mission fail. Even though while driving you can crash into other cars at over 100 miles per hour and not fail, for some reason the kick just does the right amount to anger the game. Using the autosave here provides a consistent point to keep everyone on equal footing instead of using custom save files with possibly modded cars, and it's only 47 seconds to get to the driving portion of the run. There are multiple driving techniques instantly in play to talk about later. First thing to note is the use of Franklin's power to suck the car down to the ground when going over jumps and bumps. Also this big pink box coming up, we'll talk about that in just a moment, don't worry. The speedrunner is not following Rockstar's plan route right behind Lamar but instead using speed tech to get far enough ahead of him to complete the first stunt jump while still inside this part of the mission. Instead of following through the first floor of the parking garage, the runner will go up the ramps to the top. Flashing Franklin's power on and off is again helping to keep the car on the ground while also serving its main purpose of providing extra grip to the driver. Since it's flashed on and off so fast, they never have to worry about running out of his power throughout the whole run. Approaching the top, the speedrunner has to use the correct speed based on intuition and a perfect launch angle off the jump, all to nail landing right in the corner of the magical box, which might give you an idea of what it's used for. Thanks to this mod, we can see this first box, which is the takeoff zone the car must enter to begin the stunt jump, and the pink box below is the landing area, which will turn green when the player has entered its boundary. If you've tried the complete GTA 5 stunt jumps yourself, you may have ended up like this many times going off a jump seemingly fine, but failing anyways. Going back to the modded footage, we can see the landing zone stops at this sidewalk, hence why the jump into the street fails. This is also why the speedrun wants to land in this corner. It's the only landing location for this jump that lets you continue on without having to go up the stairs afterwards, letting the player maintain a higher speed. We now finish this section of the mission by following Lamar through the Union Depository building, Instead of instantly driving away from the cops after the cutscene, the speedrun stops to punch a cop in the privates. It's for a good reason, I promise. This nutshot is so devastating the cop falls over and drops his gun. We'll pick this up and make use of it in the run, as Franklin is otherwise unarmed at this point in the game. Driving through a different landing zone we won't actually use for another 11 minutes, the routing to the next 49 jumps begins. This will also begin the first use of the gun. By aiming while going through the takeoff zone, the cutscene that normally plays during a stunt jump is now skipped. The cutscene slows down the game when it begins, though you can use a joystick or mouse wheel to speed it back up. That momentary slowdown is still enough to make up for the few seconds lost acquiring the gun earlier. As well, we can see a bus here during this jump. However, because of the cutscene, the player didn't actually see the bus until halfway through the jump, which could have caused a crash and made a failed jump much more likely. The speedrun has some traffic to the dodge on the way to the next jump. Losing the cops is not a big worry here, we'll naturally lose them later due to the speed carried between upcoming jumps. For jump number 3, the speedrun will take a sharp turn right and land as far right in the river as they can without being on the banking, as the player wants to then quickly go up the banking after coming down. Hit these stairs fast to get onto them, but then slow down and use the power to suck the car back down onto the ground. Driving in the dirt slows vehicles down, so the speedrunner does their best to stay straight on the rails, which gives the same speed as the vehicle would normally have on the road instead, up until there was a break large enough to dart back onto the street on the right. The fourth jump is at the top of another parking garage, so a calculated winding route up the floors is taken, yet again using Franklin's special power to stay glued to the ground and give a traction bonus to carry more speed through the turns. The player will come out on top, opposite the side where the jump is, 
allowing for a space to get lined up and adjust the speed for launch. In the upcoming landing, they are aiming for two specific lanes to the right, which seem to always have less traffic than the others, as well as conveniently leading towards the path to the next jump. This is the last tall parking garage in the run, but the entrance into it over the barrier is a wonderful optimization to enter as fast as possible. This landing is much more technical than it seems at a glance. The speedrun needs to have enough velocity to go over the gated parking lot below, wants to get the right angle to avoid the numerous lamps and telephone poles in this area, and try to land in the intersection, which first tends to have fewer cars in it than the lanes to the sides, and second is to the right, leading to where the speedrun wants to go next. This left side of the road, in oncoming traffic, is used here as it has better brake boost, where the player can hit the brakes over a bump to gain a big boost of speed. This side also provides a better path onto the train tracks at its end, making it easier to carry speed onto the rail bridge, where the speedrunner is once again trying to balance on top of the rails to stay off the dirt and not have as much of their momentum scrubbed off. Rockstar's placement of stunt jumps is not evenly spread, there's six of them close together on this dock. The speedrun will take tight apexes on the trailer and then building to quickly get to the first trailer jump, slowing down just enough to clear the edge of the building, then immediately getting down by falling to the right but using the awning to not roll over in the process. Then another trailer jump with a difficult angle change on approach, but at least a rather gracious landing area. Rounding the back of the docks and heading north lets the player build up a bunch of speed, but we will break pretty hard before the jump, as even though its landing area is massive, we don't need to go very far to hit the minimum jump completion, and staying near the jump point keeps close to where the next jump is. Jump 9 can be a tricky one. The speedrunner needs to make a bit of an S-bend to line up for it, but doesn't want to go too far as to waste time. This landing zone on top of the building is smaller than you may expect, and it's important to avoid the air conditioning units on top as well, and stay on the lower roof section so that chaining into the next jump with enough speed is possible. An immediate U-turn is made to head to the last jump of this bunch. For the next one, a larger run-up is needed, necessitating going between the two warehouses. This jump goes over the water, which is always risky due to the higher possibility of losing the car, and getting the launch speed right is important to land as close as possible to the edge of the dock so that there is room to turn right and continue to carry the pace. Instead of using the gates to the left, the speedrun will break through the fences to drive directly to the next jump. This also goes over the water, and requires a slight turn to the left at the final moment to get the angle right, but the landing area is much more open compared to the previous jump, so there is more leeway in the speed upon takeoff. On this part, the docks area is even flatter, which makes hitting the deceptively difficult upcoming jump more tolerable. The dirt pile is not very flat, so hitting it even slightly sideways will send the car spinning, and it can be a struggle to maintain control even with GTA 5's in-air vehicle controls. They land at the edge of the parking lot in order to avoid landing in the road where the random vehicles may be, and then do a quick turnaround for the next jump, which isn't a hard one as long as you have maintained enough speed. The speedrunner is using curb boost here. Compressing the suspension of a vehicle in GTA 5 increases the RPMs of a vehicle, which in turn gives a boost to the speed. Combining this with Franklin's ability makes the effect even stronger. There's always a chance of a vehicle over this blind on-ramp. In fact, being a smaller car like that one made it harder to detect than being a tall truck as is common here. Another dirt ramp, again requiring a more precise angle, and just barely making it into the landing zone so that it's quicker to turn around and head in the opposite direction. A big brake boost onto the bridge, and driving in oncoming traffic is not much of a scare to the speedrunner at this point. Then a line that minimizes airtime over the dirt to lead to the next jump. The speed is important here for this one. Too slow and you land on the hill and bounce up, but any faster than this and you land outside of the bounty box for the jump. A break through another fence, purposely perpendicular and with a flash of Franklin's power to help escape from this industrial area quicker than waiting for a gate to open. Something I didn't have time to mention at the start, it's lucky for us that the mission failing defaults to using this white 9F as the vehicle in this drive, as it's great at hitting these big brake boosts while also being much better at handling compared to the other option the game gives you, a red Rapid GT, as that car handles terribly over bumps. Jumping onto the airport parking garage is quite difficult, as you must get the speed and angle just right in order to land as close as possible to the ramp that is used to get back down right after. The ability to use the gun to skip the cutscene is for some reason disabled on these two big vertical ramps at the airport, seen again here on the second one. This second one required much lower speed and less precision than the previous. In-air controls are used to turn the car around to closer face the next jump, which leads us into the airport. The speedrunner will turn slightly left going off the jump in order to keep away from possibly parked cars, signs, and the building on the left. 
Then the second use of the gun comes into play, shooting the gas trailer to blow it up. Four of the tankers here are static, but this bigger one is a dynamic, actual towable trailer which takes fewer shots from a gun to explode. We'll take a look at a map to explain why the speedrunner wanted to die. The jumps we just did include a few in the middle of the city, but were mostly centered around the east and southern docks part of the city before ending up over at the airport. Most of the jumps left are in the north part of the city. Instead of driving back up, since this is all taking place in the second mission of the game, dying will take us back to the last checkpoint in the middle of the city, as well as refreshing the car. Even on a near perfect run like this, the damage can start to add up from landings and fence hits. The speedrunner will need to again stop in order to get the officer's gun after respawning, as well as sit in the driver's seat of the cop car, as doing that gives you a shotgun. The shotgun can't be held while going off stunt jumps, and the pistol can't be used for what the shotgun is needed for later, so both gun types are required. The first jump in the second part of the speedrun leads onto the freeway, and the runner jumps to the edge of the landing area to avoid slowing down as much as possible, and the far lane of the freeway tends to have the least and easiest traffic to avoid. The next jump quickly goes over the freeway and must be timed to not hit any trucks in the close lanes and be fast enough to lane in the dirt on the opposite side, but not so fast that you hit the top of the car on the overpass. Then up onto said overpass to use the main downtown freeway to drive to the next jump, coming up to number 22 now. The brake boosts are massive on this road, but much of this speed will need to be lost by the time of hitting the actual jump, as the landing box does not go far enough for all the speed that would be possible and then just hope and pray there's no random vehicle below, as there's no vision of the landing zone beforehand. Then they maintain the same speed, as the next jump's landing area is similarly small compared to how fast you could be going here. Next jump is my favorite to watch. Abusing the landing zone that extends outside and below the highway, the speedrunner will aim far left, land in the grass, then tactically bounce off the tree to change the car's momentum towards the next jumps. This quick chaining of events continues into the next jump, over a drainage ditch where they use slightly more speed than is necessary so that a quick turn and skip over the full river can be executed, avoiding getting slowed down by landing in the water, and having just enough speed to immediately hit the big jump all the way into the heliport, having just the minimum amount of velocity needed to clear this roadway and get moving again. Another fence break to keep a more direct line onto this road that can have pretty random traffic, along with the next few roads in fact. To minimize vehicle interference, the speedrunner will aim to land in the middle of the road coming off the parking lot jump, which usually ends up fine as long as there is not a bus in the closer lane. The jump off the pagoda carries a similar traffic risk, so the speedrunner will be looking at the vehicles to their left before turning right up the hill to the jump. Staying slower and closer to the same direction lanes as seen here is usually the safest plan to go for. It is possible to jump all the way over the traffic back there, but then the runner is left with a worse path towards the next stunt jump and being in the air is almost always slower. When your tires aren't touching the ground, you aren't accelerating so airtime is slower. The speedrun will stay right and land in the dirt on this jump, another planned traffic avoidance technique. They then use the smoother indent in the cliff to go up, using the power to keep the car planted once on top. This same spot is used in the full run during the mission Reuniting the Family, about four and a half hours into that speedrun. The landing area for this next jump is rather generous. The difficulty is hitting the ramp itself at a lower speed and proper angle to avoid having the construction or wall debris hit the car on the way down causing a failed stunt jump. At this point, we are pretty far out on the edge of the city again. It'd be easy to turn left and then crash into the gas station here to explode once more and teleport back to the city center. However, looking at the map can explain why we will want to keep driving for a while. A few jumps exist far north outside of the city, and we will want to finally finish the mission in order to go complete those stunt jumps. To end the mission, we need to go back to the center of the city near here. We've done these jumps on the west side of the city so far in the second part of the speedrun. There is a line of jumps that lead back to the city center here, kind of near the golf course. So even though the route isn't as straight a line as the jumps themselves, Going to collect these, and then the final few left in the city leads directly towards Simeon's dealership where we can finish the mission. So instead the run continues on to the right, heading up the hills to the next jump. Brake boosting, curb boosting, traffic avoidance, and racing lines are all at play here on this pretty pure driving section. I've mentioned using Franklin's power to keep the car on the ground, and to fall faster. You may have wondered why this is never done during the stunt jumps themselves, and it's because you can't. You were unable to activate Franklin's power during stunt jumps even with the cutscene skip by aiming the gun. So on the approach to this jump, 
the speedrun activates the power at the top to avoid airtime before hitting the jump, but then has to adjust speed in order to jump just the right distance, making the precise landings on each stunt jump more impressive as they can't use Franklin's power to adjust fall rate mid airtime. That jump is also another good example of going the minimum distance in order to reduce airtime and getting back to having the wheels on the ground as soon as possible. Entering the golf course, this NPC must lose his legs in the name of time save, and entering the course gives cops anyways, so this pedestrian hit doesn't matter as it would elsewhere in the run. The golf jump is agonizingly slow to stay within the bounds of its tiny landing zone, and then speed must be quickly regained in order to break this fence. It's probably the toughest in the whole game, and I'm betting most people didn't even know it could be smashed through. Driving alongside this massive landing area, and we want to make use of just 1% of it, turning around as soon as possible to have enough speed to just barely make it into the bounding box, yet again landing around the median to reduce the chance of traffic interference. This jump through the shopping center is really difficult. The curved impromptu ramp will send the back of the car to the side, and it will need to be recovered with in-air controls to stay within the thin landing zone. The speed on our hopes to lose the cops they got from the golf course are around now, as we need to have no wanted level to finish the mission. They however have an unlucky encounter with an officer in the tunnel here, but fortunately we'll have good cop spawns later on, allowing the wanted level to disappear. This jump aims for the pedestrian island, as there's usually no people actually standing there and never any traffic to land on in that spot. In GTA 5 speedruns, whether a full game run or side category like stunt jumps, runners will lower their in-game settings to improve performance, but also because lowering the distance scaling option reduces the amount of small props mostly on sidewalks. In the upcoming jump specifically, there would otherwise be cones in the opening which can cause car physics to get pretty whack, and the landings don't usually work as well as shown in this clip. The speedrun, free of cone intervention, goes off and perfectly lands in the corner of the bounding box, meaning they carried as much speed as possible while also landing in the middle of the road to avoid any traffic that would be under them. Here's the lucky cop spawns, or lack thereof, with none being outside this police station, letting us immediately head to the next jump and again nail the spot in the corner of the Rockstar affected landing zone. You have to understand how impressive this is to do 50 times in a row. You cannot see these landing zones on approach most of the time. It's muscle memory knowing how fast the car should be going approaching the jumps. And this jump is a slow one, just barely needing a bit of speed to make it onto the sidewalk and then turn into the back of Simeon's dealership to finally continue the mission we've been inside of this whole time. The runner spam presses the change character button to stop voice lines from playing, and walking out of the dealership instantly enters the cutscene, instead of having animations play first when you walk inside. And finally that shotgun we picked up 7 minutes ago comes into play. Shooting a gun inside the dealership fails the mission, and will again use the mission skip feature to do this 3 times, which takes the player directly to the end of the mission instead of having to drive back to Franklin's house. Now, we could be using the pistol to fail here instead, and that was the strat for a few years, but on the second and third fail, you would have to manually reload the pistol. This takes an extra 2 seconds to reload, so 4 seconds, minus the 2 seconds it took to get the shotgun, this saves 2 seconds overall. The reason the pistol had to be reloaded is partially known. Guns you get from cops in GTA 5 seem to have low ammo counts. The shotgun only has 10 shots, 2 of which are loaded, 8 stored. The pistol holds 12 shots in a magazine, which is also how much you get when picking it up from the officer. The speculation is that since the pistol only has one full magazine worth of ammo, that somehow causes it to require the reload. Back in the main timeline, the speedrunner calls a taxi before the mission pass screen appears. This is tough, as it's a small window to do quite a few button presses on the phone, but allows for the 10 second taxi spawn timer to begin much sooner as you'd otherwise have to wait the call until outside with Franklin. The speedrunner manipulates the taxi spawn location by looking where they don't want the taxi to spawn, allowing it to appear right in front of Franklin. They then use the map to mark the location of the next jump, and will use the fast travel function of the taxi to directly warp there. By finishing the mission, we've appeared at Franklin's house and ran a bit, marked in orange, and then used the taxi to warp over to the oil fields. Jump 39 here, while being in the city, is far enough out of the way that routing has changed from driving over to it to instead including it in the taxi part of the run. The speedrun will do this single jump, then call another taxi to head north for the final 11 jumps up there, which are even more spread out. The player first has to steal this taxi in order to use it to complete the jump. The key points of this ramp are to have enough speed to just make it into the landing zone and avoid hitting the power pole on the way down. The speedrunner will then call for another taxi right away while heading for the road. 
The taxi will spawn near the location you were at when the call connects, not when you first start dialing. Then we send Franklin down the hill to take some damage, about half his HP, because we want to die to an NPC later on, and the player having lower health lets the NPC kill us quicker. This leads directly into more camera manipulation to be looking backwards exactly 10 seconds after the call ended, to ensure the taxi spawns right in front of Franklin again. A location near the next jump is selected and warped to. This time, we'll call the taxi before jumping. This means the player must be near the road when the call connects, and have a bit of speed built up already to get moving quickly. They have only 10 seconds to then get off road, complete the jump, and return to the general area to collect the next taxi. It is quite nice the taxi company will continually send taxis to the player as long as you aren't getting the taxi driver out by injuring them. We are a paying customer each time, as Franklin starts the game with enough money to just barely afford the multiple taxis taken. A quick flip of the camera ensures the correct spawn location for our next victim, the taxi. Selecting the location on the map is assisted by pressing the button to place a point of interest, which reveals an area around the map where placed. As since this is a new save file, most of the northern areas of Los Santos aren't yet revealed, so the speedrunner memorizes the general location of each taxi jump, then uses points of interest to get the exact marker placement. The warp positions are located just far enough from the jumps to allow the player to build enough speed for a safe landing, such as the only perfectly flat area here being the freeway. We won't instantly take another taxi now though, as there are two more close by jumps. For number 42, the speedrunner needs to drive past it a ways and turn around to have enough speed in the correct direction. Even with that buildup, this hits just the edge of the landing zone, planned by the speedrunner, but shows how that jump requires more speed than you may expect to complete. The speedrunner will now commit a federal offense and jump into the prison. This jump is tough, as without the mod showing where the takeoff box is, there are few markers to help line up the location, short of some bushes and towers in the distance people use to help get the right angle for the jump. The speed is important as it's a tiny landing area, and hitting the fence or building first will fail. Thanks to losing HP earlier, when the guards immediately start shooting Franklin after we land, he dies almost instantly. If the guards miss or Franklin had more HP, the shotgun would be used to shoot and explode the gas tank of the taxi. The player now respawns in Sandy Shores. When dying, you are teleported to the closest hospital, and this works out that we end up near two more jumps that need completed. A taxi will be called again as there are no vehicles nearby. It's faster to call the taxi than to run over to the highway and attempt to steal something random. The speedrunner is looking backwards again to spawn the taxi in front of them, which means it will be closer to them to get into and also be facing the direction of the next jump. The player will do a mid-drive when accelerating away here, which is a way to boost the vehicle by tapping the handbrake at a precise moment between gear shifts, usually here between second to third, also sometimes known as a double clutch by some GTA communities. The jump over the motel has an oddly large takeoff zone, but there's only one ramp to hit. While the landing zone is also large, we will aim for the right as it's the most open and we need to carry speed into the left turn after. The call to the next taxi will be started as the car lands after going over the train tracks. This time's the call to connect on a small dirt road on the north side of the airport. After hanging up the call, the speedrunner has 10 seconds to do the jump and return to the position where the call connected to ensure the cab will spawn in. The taxi cannot spawn on this dirt road itself, but rather the closest area that carries normal traffic, where the speedrun looks away from in order to not block it from being able to spawn in. Similar to in GT Online, your mechanic vehicles cannot spawn where you are looking. The speedrun always selects the marker for the next jump while entering the taxi. This is because the game pauses no matter when you enter the map, so doing it during the door opening animation ensures that no other inputs will be needed near the time you are pausing and unpausing. The speedrunner has the phone up again to execute another quick cab. This is a short, typical jump, so it's probably the easiest quick cab to do. The call connects just before taking off, so the speedrun can take its time returning to the watch point, and after 10 seconds, they can turn around to face the freshly spawned taxi, which is able to spawn on this dirt road because it is a road that other NPC vehicles commonly drive down. You may have noticed, the player always enters taxis on the passenger side, the reason for this is that when getting out after warping, stealing the taxi from the passenger side has a faster push out the driver animation, rather than the longer one of Franklin pulling the poor driver out. This jump in the canyon has a half quick cap. Because the phone is up, the gun cannot be used to aim and skip the stunt jump's cutscene. It's worth it though, as the call is timed to connect right as the vehicle lands. There isn't enough time to return to the launching ramp here, but since we land on a valid taxi road, the call location can be set as soon as possible. 
The spawn point of the taxi is manipulated again by looking where we don't want the taxi to spawn, allowing it to be right in front of Franklin, who will then warp again up north to Polito Bay. This location is the closest we warp to a jump, but it requires so little speed to complete that a further run-up is not necessary, once again using the passenger side to get into the driver's seat quicker, and this bird sadly dies almost every run. The next jump, second to last, is also located in Polito Bay, so we can drive over to it, waiting for a smooth spot on the cliff on the right to traverse up. We will be doing a quick cab on this jump, so the call is started upon approach for it to connect and be hung up just before entering the construction yard where the jump is. Breaking through yet another fence, this jump is taken very slowly as we don't want to go over the barrier in this parking lot so that the speedrunner can stay close to where the taxi is going to spawn, and they look to the right to make sure it can appear close to the other side of them. There's only one jump left, the infamous jump onto the lighthouse. One last taxi warp gets the speedrun over there, with enough of a run-up distance to get their speed just perfect for the jump onto the island. There is almost always a mountain lion here when spawning, but it seems to get spooked by the crime of us stealing the taxi like an NPC on the sidewalk would. Kind of a funny interaction. But this jump is serious. The nerves of trying to hit the last jump with the correct velocity and angle after doing 49 previous jumps? Well, our speedrunner nails it. 22 minutes and 6 seconds to complete all 50 jumps in GTA 5, and this time is kind of lying to you. This run was a spliced run for demonstration purposes, made up of putting a few full runs together to showcase the best possible gameplay along with explaining the strats. The current world record though is 22 minutes and 50 seconds by Saris. That's only 44 seconds slower, which is crazy. And 12 of those seconds happen because he gets an unlucky NPC spawn under the car on the jump before the mission ends. While making this video, the quick cob on the airport rock is actually a new strat I found, which saves another 12 seconds over previous runs. The world record time of 2250, minus 12 for the fail and 12 for the new strat, means his time could easily just be 20 seconds off this video's segmented run. Back in the early all stunt jumps days, the run was closer to 50 minutes or longer. With strat changes and gameplay improvement, I had the record for about a year around 25 to 24 minutes, but Saris came in and has dominated this category ever since, and I've improved my time but not enough to catch up. So it made sense to pay Saris to record all the gameplay in this video to show the best. If you'd like to see his world record stunt jumps run, or check out his other full game runs where he's one of the game's best players, it's linked in the pinned comment. The stunt jump practice mod was also an awesome addition to this video, letting us see where the landing and takeoff zones are. This mod was made by Video Game Hacker with help from Jordan, and you can get it off their GitHub if you are on PC and want to try it yourself. Do note, it's not allowed to be used in actual runs being submitted to the speedrun.com leaderboards, but it's great for practice or just curiosity. They also have a sweet write-up on the technical details of how the mod was made and the system Rockstar uses for detecting stunt jumps was decoded. You can get a link to that in the description. As for me, thank you for watching, and if you are binge watching all my videos, enjoy and consider subscribing if you are a few videos deep so you can keep up with what's next. There do be a like button somewhere, and keep an eye out for a follow-up video to this one, where I will show the full map used in this video, compare those older runs that took up to 50 minutes, and explain more in depth how quick cab jumps work, along with how I found the new one over the airport rock while making this video. 